Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, I pray that your spirit would just give to each of us now from your holy scriptures words that would sink in to our hearts, to our minds, Lord, even deep into our souls, that we would, in this place, draw closer to you, our maker. And we're grateful, Lord, that we have your handiwork all around us, Lord, the birds singing in the trees, the waves rolling, lapping up onto the seashore here, Lord. And we just, we have, we have such a, a testimony of your glory. But we want to now put our attention to the one who made this glory, to our creator. We ask that you would draw near to us in this place. You said if we would but draw near to you, that you would come near to us. You would draw near. Draw near to us, Lord. We would feel your presence in this place, and we would we'd be able to hear what your Spirit wants us to hear. We ask that now in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. You know, Jesus would always end his sermons with let those that have an ear to hear, let them hear what the, the Spirit says. You know, he'd teach wonderful messages, and then he would end with that, and, and his own disciples would go, we don't get what you're talking about. And Jesus said to the, to, to just that the words of Isaiah would be fulfilled to the masses, they would, they would have ears, but they wouldn't actually hear. He quotes Isaiah, he says, they have eyes, but they don't actually perceive, they don't see. And so the things of the Spirit sometimes are, are going on right around us. In fact, sometimes God's Spirit is working on the person right next to you, and He's doing a marvelous work in their lives, and you're sitting there going, I don't think anything's happening today. You know, I'm pretty sure God's just like not moving. And He can be work. Can't, isn't that true? How some days you just know the Lord is really working on you, and other days you're just like, where are you, Lord? What's going on? Well, this morning, we're going to look at, uh, continue our look at 1 Corinthians 6, where we saw last week that Paul has written to the church at Corinth about their, this, the issue of that sexual immorality that had entered into the church there at Corinth, where that man had taken his own, his father's, his father's wife to bed. And so Paul writes, to the church of Corinth says that guy is sexually in sin he's uh, immoral and he's and you guys aren't doing anything about it you need to you need to take that guy and remove him from the church that's a uh, that, that that's an infection spiritually that's going to spread you need to get that out and so they put the man out you remember and some of those that haven't read this portion of scripture later he has to write back because it th does it work does it make the guy repent the answer is yes it does make him repent. That's why he writes 2 Corinthians. He says, when he writes in the, the, the second letter, he has to actually say, you guys, you put him out. He broke off his sin. It woke him up. It was a, it was a spiritual wake-up call. Like, hey, this is really serious. And, and so he repented of his sin. But they were so good at putting people out. I, I think they sound like some churches today. They, they, they didn't want to take the guy back after he repented. You know, it's like they forgot the whole, the, the whole story what Jesus did with the um, prodigal son, you know? I mean, when the prodigal son comes back and says, I'm not even worthy to be your son, what's the father's attitude? Throw a party, my son is back. You know, but, but in the church, somebody who's backslidden comes back, we're like, what are you doing here? You really shouldn't be here. You know you backslid. Instead, we should be going, let's have a, a prodigal son party, you know? Praise the Lord, the, pro the prodigal has returned. He was once, what was the father's attitude? He was dead, but now he's what? Alive. alive. We should be like, all right, they're back, they're alive. I mean, so the immorality had, I mean, it's impossible to be in this world without having the world try to get into us. And so... Paul had to address that, and he says, but, but we have a cure for those things of the world that try to get into us. So just like the example I've used many a time, and since, do I have any boats on the horizon? There we go. The boat out there is made to be in the ocean. It's okay. 
No problem with the boat being in the water. The only problem is when the water, too much of it gets into the what? Into the boat. And that's the way we are as Christians in this world. We're meant to be in this world, but not of this world. In other words, we're in this world like the boat is in the water, but we're not to have the water inside of us. We're not to have the world inside of us. Otherwise, it corrupts us. So Paul reminds the church that they were once living in the world. They were once in sin. They were immoral. They were doing all the same stuff that all the worldly people around them were doing. And we came to verse 11 last week and we saw that Paul said, and such were some of us, the, the real immoral bunch, the ones that did wrong and fornicated and, 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 and thieved and, and were covetous and drunkards. and Well, he gives a whole list of host of sins. He says, such were some of us, but, but, we were what? Washed and we were sanctified and we were justified. If you weren't with us last week, just check out on YouTube. It's not up yet. They're, they're still working on getting it ready, but it'll be up soon. The sermon from last week on those three things. We were washed of that sin. We were justified. We were, I'm sorry, we were sanctified, set apart for God's special use. And we were justified in the name of our Lord, just as if we had never sinned. That's what Paul says has happened to us now. And now that we have been washed and we've been set apart for a holy use and we've been made just as if we never sinned, Paul has something that, that he needs to tell the Corinthian church, which I think the church today could benefit from hearing. Truly, the rest of this chapter is one of those real good things for, okay, now that we're washed. How, how many of us came to the Lord not perfect? And the Lord washed us, and he sanctified us, and he justified us. Now, what do we do that he's done that? What's the conclusion? Well, this is the conclusion, the next thought. And Paul is a master at taking these things and breaking them down step by step so that people can, you know, like, I don't know, mostly it's, I think, a guy thing. We like everything in an order. You know, put it in the order, lay it out. Spell out what's next. Therefore, this is happening. Okay, good. But I know there's some of you gals that think the same way. Not all. Some. Some. But Paul says in the next thing, listen to Paul, he says, verse 12. He says, all things are lawful for me. But not all things are what? Profitable. Profitable. This is, a, this is a, a revelation, hopefully, that many of you already you've read this a long time ago. You know this verse. How many of you have heard this? All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. You heard that before? What's that mean? Has, has that ever, like, have you ever taken time to think that one through and let it, like, digest in your mind? Like, it's lawful to do all things, he says, but... It doesn't always profit you. Just because just because it's allowed doesn't always make it good for you. This is what, all, to me, all things lawful, but not all things profitable. It really, it really helps me balance a lot of things in life. This, this truth, what Paul is going to teach the church now, once we're washed and we're sanctified and we're justified, he says, now we've got to know how to live. Okay, so, so we have all that stuff washed away. That's great. But now that it's washed away, does that mean free for all, do whatever we want? Remember when Paul wrote to the church at Rome in, in Romans 6, he said, shall we continue to sin that grace might abound? You know, since all our sin was forgiven by God's grace, should we just keep sinning? And what was his answer? God forbid. May it never be. No way. Just, cause, just because you were made clean doesn't like say, okay, free slate to go on and sin your brains out. That's not what, that, that, that wasn't the whole wash you clean, get you all spiffied up and sanctified and justified just so that you could start over and mess up the slate again. And so Paul starts to teach something that I think is one of the greatest spiritual attitudes. In fact, I think if you use this in, in like all different areas of your life, 
this this you could use this like um, some people like to use mottos or mantras you know something to to live by how about this one old things are lawful but they're not all profitable Am I allowed to eat chocolate cake? Yeah. It's lawful, right? I have a gluten intolerance. If I eat chocolate cake made with flour, if I eat my wife's one made with rice flour, I can get away with it. The only problem is I eat too much chocolate cake. It might be lawful, but is it going to profit me? Am I going to feel... I don't know, but see, something changed in, as I've gotten, you know, some of us when we crest 50, break that line. Once you go over that, you're like, you start to learn that this, this particular mantra is really words to live by. Like more than you could, when you were young, you could get away with a lot of stuff, fudge on a lot of eating. No problem. The furnace just burnt it up. You get a little older and you're like, you know, it might be lawful. I might be allowed to eat this half a gallon of ice cream, but <laughs> you laugh. My wife and I got <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't. Can I tell them about our honeymoon? On our honeymoon, we're young newlyweds. We just got married. We moved out. We got our little apartment. And we're going up to northern Arizona to Judd's Cabins. This is like the getaway where her folks used to take her. We're, we're going to go to the ghetto getaway cabin, the really cheapo cabins that they used to go to. They were fishing cabins in northern Arizona. And we're like, we get it. We, we're married. We can do whatever we want. We're young. We're young. And it's, it's Arizona. Now, just to let you know, it's it September. It was hot. Even in September, it's, you know, September 7th, we got married. 1986, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> 31 years ago. And so we go, oh, man, I, I am so hot. I want some ice cream. Me too. But see, even back then, ice cream by the scoop was a ripoff. You know, you paid a nickel and you got like one little round thing with the two little things from the, from the drugstore. And then... And we're like, forget that, because for a couple bucks, we can get half a gallon. <laughs> cookies and cream. The good stuff. And so we, we got a half a gallon of ice cream, and we're driving from Phoenix up to northern Arizona. And, of course, we don't have any refrigeration or coolers with us. We're on our honeymoon, so we got a half a gallon of ice cream that's got to be consumed. Now, for two little guys, and, okay, Jan was like 99, 90 eight pounds somewhere in there and I was about a, a 119 at the time so we were huge <laughs> and we had a spoon <laughs> a spoon a piece and we were driving down the road and we are like well it's melting we gotta go <laughs> and we just eat the whole thing and we're like nobody can tell us what to do we can eat this if we want to because we're, you know, adults now. We're married. And we're just scooping away and having fun driving, talking. And we eat the whole thing. And now it's lawful. Okay? It's allowed. You can have a half a gallon between two people. Although, <laughs> after a little bit, <laughs> kind of feel a little bit like, mm, I don't feel so good. <laughs> and she's going, I don't feel so good either. And I think, you know, it's part brain freeze and part, like, a little bit of maybe, it was lawful but not profitable. A little overload on the sugar content. You know, probably diabetic coma coming on is what it was. And we, but we survived. We're still here today. The thing is, I don't think we could do that today and get away with it. She says, I don't know. <laughs> she, okay, wait a minute. I couldn't. She could. I'm pretty sure. She could probably do the whole gallon by herself. But that's just the way. See, if we, it individually, it does change, doesn't it? Maybe she could get away with it today, but I can't. It might be lawful for me to eat that, but I figured out not always profitable. I don't always feel good if I do. You know, and, and I use this. I use this wisdom a lot in the area of physical food that I consume, you know, that I have to just use that wisdom and think, okay, 
be careful what I put in because whatever I put in, I got, you know, my body's got to process and deal with and, and run off of. And at a certain point, I really, you know, I did bodybuilding for, for a hobby for a while. I was just sick of being a little skinny guy. So I thought, I'm going to lift and get bigger. And, and I started learning that food is actually a fuel. You know, and it, it's the building blocks of muscle, if it's the right food. I mean, you can put the wrong, the ice cream didn't really build the parts, you know, that build this part, but not this part, you know. So I had to, like, learn to eat the stuff that would profit my body. Now, I use this as an example because people identify with this idea of, you know, yeah, there's certain things that are more profitable for me to do for my physical disciplines. But we're talking about the Word of God today. And we're talking about spiritual disciplines. It, do we need to put good food in for our spirit to get fed? Yes. yes. Do we need to hear the Word of God in its pure form to feed our spirit that's the building blocks, the stuff that strengthens our faith? And the answer is yes. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. You need to hear the Word of God to help strengthen your faith. Just like, a, just like you need food to strengthen your body, your, your faith needs a, a, a meal. But see, some of you guys, I hate to tell you this, but if you, if you trained physically like you do spiritually, well, I'm pretty sure you'd die. I mean, let's just be honest. Some of you eat spiritual food once a week. So let's put you on the same regime eating for physical food. I mean, let's just balance this out. If we ate physical food the same number of times we eat a spiritual meal, would we survive? This is a good self-check for you, by the way. If you're going, oh, wait a minute, Pastor, you're going to make me go too lean. Well, I'm going to turn into a little twig and vaporize if I go to then I suggest to you you need to feed your spirit a bit, a bit more. Because you feed your body plenty. I'm pretty sure you feed yourself every day. We don't even, I don't even have to tell people to do that. Hey, don't forget to eat this week. What a good pastor. He reminded me I need to eat. Never have to do that. But I do have to remind people that they need to feed their spirit every day. They'd say, well, I want to be strong spiritually like you are. How much food are you taking in? Spiritual food. How much, now, you know, when I, if I'll use the same physical analogy, when it comes to becoming stronger, you want to build some muscle, there's not just how much you eat and eating the right kinds of foods to build the muscle, but there's some other components you know, it's broken down real simple today. I mean, you can read this in any of the fitness magazines, the bodybuilding. They'll tell you, you know, there's the components of you've got to eat right. You have to lift the correct amount to break the muscle tissue down, but not too much. And you have to give it one other component. Anyone know the last one? Rest. The, the tissue needs rest to recuperate and rebuild. Do you know that you need the same three components for your spiritual growth? You need to get fed spiritually. You need to exercise, like Paul says, the gifts of God which you have been given. He didn't say, you need to take out your gifts and play with them on the floor. <laughs> he said you need to exercise the gifts that you've been given of the Holy Ghost. Whatever gift you have. Maybe you have the gift of hospitality. Maybe you're just a gift, you have the gift of, you know, there's a gift even of giving with liberality freely. Some people are really just generous givers. That's a gift. They just, and they have it. They just, but whatever your gift is, if your gift is teaching like mine, then what am I supposed to do? Exercise my gift. Teach. Whatever gift you've been given of the Holy Ghost, you must use it. And yes, exercise can suck. It can take energy. It can take work. It can be inconvenient. But if you're going to grow 
It's like you got to do the spiritual gym. You've got to use the gift. And then you need that last component, one that I'm the worst at. I'm still working on the third part. I can tell you about it, though. I know it's there. Because it's also the same one I have problem with in the physical realm. You need to have rest so you can have the recuperation. You know, I'm, 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 you know, in bodybuilding, I was really good at hitting the exercise part down. I was good at eating, but I just didn't take enough rest. I could never figure out, why am I keep getting sick? Why am I always, like, the first one to catch a cold when someone passes by with a sneeze? Why am I the first one always falling down, you know? And I didn't, even though the scripture teaches all of these things as spiritual truths, and by the way, everything that is true in the spiritual realm, it has a shadow down here in the physical realm. But the shadow is much lesser than the truth up here. And yet, here I am, let me tell you the true stuff. And I'm failing on the shadow down here. The rest part. You've you got to have enough rest for the body to rebuild. Do you guys know that you even have to have rest for your spirit? The book of Hebrews tells us, therefore, let us fear that lest we would not enter into what? His rest. There is a place of rest for your spirit. Will you rest in the fact that God's got it? How many believe God knows what he's doing? And he's got it covered, right? Except he needs your help this week. Because he can't do it without you. <laughs> she said, thank God he doesn't. That's right. He does not need our help. I know, I know we think he does and we want to help him. But he's fully capable of handling stuff without us. He's been doing the job a lot longer than we've been alive, if you can receive it. He's been on the throne, right, for eternity, eons and eons. I mean, guys are going, oh, my gosh, I didn't think of this one. I can't help you out, Izzy. That's a big problem. No. It doesn't freak him out. He goes, I got this. And because he has it, this is where my spirit has to hear. I, by the way, I, I'm only preaching to me, not you guys. You just can listen in. I need to hear God's got it down and he's got it in control. And I can rest in his ability, not mine, in the, in the finished work of our Lord. Because that's where my rest spiritually comes from. When I realize he finished it. When he hung on the cross, the last three words he said, it is what? finished gotta take care of don't sweat it i got it now paul says just to get this in perspective all things are lawful but not all things are profitable for you mahalo for joining us if you'd like more information about us go to our website amazinggracekona.com and click the link to follow us on facebook that's amazinggracekona.com mahalo and god bless